morning, everyone, and welcome to the sixth call in our summer series. Today, we are going to be learning all about the world of scent science. We are going to be hearing from Dr. Mark Bartlett. He is the Executive VP of Science and Product Development at Young Living Essential Oils. He works in the Research Institute. He is a brilliant man. I love learning about how oils work. I love learning which ones can be used for different purposes. Um, and really for me, the proof is in the pudding, you know, how, how I experience them, the results that I get when I use them. But one of the things I really appreciate and find fascinating is the science behind why they work. Um, so yes, I love the experiential part of it and knowing that they work, but the behind the scenes and the nitty gritty of why they work um, is just such an incredible science to me. The intricate details that are inside of the oils themselves, inside of our bodies, the molecular structure and how they interact with one another. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm just a science geek um, and <laughs> I find it really interesting. So I hope that you will too. We will be watching this video. It's about um, 35 minutes. And as with all of the videos in this summer series, these were recorded during Young Living's Grand Convention 2003. 23 uh, in July. So we're going to be uh, listening in as Dr. Bartlett shares this fascinating, awesome information. I'm going to be sharing my screen with you. Give me just a moment to switch over and enjoy the content. As always, uh, if you have questions or comments or want to interact at the end of today's call, we definitely will have an opportunity to do that uh, once we wrap up. So stick around to the end and I will um, be here once we hear from Dr. Bartlett. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Wow, it's good to be here. And there's still some people here. The convention is not over yet, right? <laughs> so glad to be here and, and follow Brian. We're going to talk a little bit about social media as well. But first, let me introduce the topic. You guys probably know a lot more about essential oils and how they work and how they um, and the science of scent than me. But one of the ways that I learn is to uh, go study it out for myself and then try to teach it. So if you hear some stuff that you've heard before today, that's okay. We'll I'll be reminding you hopefully. So um, we'll talk about our amazing sense of smell today and just how amazing it is. And we're going to use essential oils to kind of cement that and help us to understand. We're going to talk a little bit about the mystery of the sense of smell and the science of it, a little bit about how it works and what we know. We will talk about what Young Living is doing to discover more and a little bit about our why. Why do we care? So let's get started. Um, sharks are tweeting now. So I'm so glad that I followed Brian because it's all about social media with the sharks. Uh, in Australia, you know, people are pretty nervous about sharks. So they, they now have tagged the sharks so that as soon as they get to a certain place close to the beach, then they tweet to the life surfers, uh, the surf lifesaving guys like, okay, I'm coming close to the beach now. Just tweeting to my friends. I might try to get a selfie with one of the, one of the swimmers. Now, if only they had had this when I was a kid because... Seriously, 12,000 miles of beautiful golden coastline sand in Australia, and I love being at the beach, but my mother was always reminding me, what about the sharks? And, and that kind of as if it's not scary enough as it is. And I was a little bit of a geek as a kid, and I knew that sharks have an amazing sense of smell. But they can smell, of course, blood in the water. We know that in traces. And as a nerd, as a kid um, in Australia at that time, in the late 60s, we only had three stations on TV and they're all black and white. And the cartoons were only on Saturday morning. So I spent a lot of time reading and I learned that a shark's sense of smell is highly developed. It's one of its most acute and vital senses, far surpassing that of other animals. And they have olfactory bulbs located in their snouts, thousands of sensory cells. And I learned that they can detect stuff in the water down to a part per million. And I didn't really know what a part per million meant. Now that I, now I know it's a milligram per kilogram. But, <laughs> but that kind of freaked me out. I thought, these guys are amazing. Okay, they can smell me a lot longer before I can see the fin. Um, 
And I'm just really amazed at the sensory perception of animals. But humans also, it turns out, have an olfactory epithelia. And in fact, our sense of smell is pretty miraculous. We have about 400 different kinds of these olfactory receptors in our noses, and our sense of smell can be surprisingly powerful. Uh, one odor molecule can actually activate several different olfactory receptors. And uh, many of these olfactory sensory neurons, that's actually really quite interesting because they're neurons, right? Which are like nerve cells and your brain has plenty of them, but they're all tucked away inside your skull at the olfactory epithelia, which is up here somewhere. It's the only place where these nerves are more or less hanging out in the breeze and waiting for odorants to come so that it can process them. Isn't that amazing? Right up there in the olfactory receptor. And these are fairly short lived um, cells that are continuously being replaced by the stem cell layer. So it's estimated that we grow a new nose about every two weeks. Pretty amazing, right? Um, I found this little video on the web and I wanna share it with you. That kind of helps us appreciate a little bit more about how sensitive our noses are. So let's play that video. Hey everybody, this week, let's take it a little slower and watch this raindrop create the smell of a summer storm. The earthy smell of a gentle rain after a dry spell is so evocative that it has its own word. It means the smell of dust after rain. What does? Petrical. The word comes from the Greek for the blood of stones. It was coined by two poetically minded Australian scientists searching for the source of the scent. Isabel Baer and Richard Thomas studied petrichor in the 1960s. It's a humble area of research, but a universal experience. And it has two main sources plants and bacteria living in the soil. Bear and Thomas found that they could extract a yellow oil from warm, dry rocks, clay, and soil. That oil, petrichor, contained fatty acids from plants, mostly palmitic acid and stearic acid, as well as smaller compounds. These long fatty acids don't smell like much, but after some time in the soil, the researchers found they got broken down into a smorgasbord of much smaller, much smellier molecules. What isn't clear is what these fatty acids do. Petrichor is released from the soil after long dry spells. There's often a surge of plant growth when it first rains after such a drought. Baron Thomas thought that petrichor might have something to do with it. They gave some to plants, but it didn't help them grow. Plants given petrichor actually withered. It's been speculated that plants might secrete fatty acids during dry spells to slow other plants down and cut out competition for water, which is pretty ruthless for a plant. Around the same time, another duo of scientists isolated a compound associated with both freshly plowed earth and tainted fish. They too coined a classical name for their discovery, geosmin, meaning the smell of earth. Geosmin is produced by a group of bacteria called actinomyces, and no one is quite sure why. You may smell it in your garden in freshly turned soil or newly watered plants, and yes, after a light rain. Geosmin creates an unpalatable taste in water and any fish that live in it, and it imparts an earthy flavor to beets. The smell is nicer, and we now know it's an important part of petrichor. Our noses can detect geosmin at concentrations less than 10 parts per trillion. That's around a teaspoonful in 200 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Since the 60s, few researchers have paid much attention to petrichor. It wasn't until 2015 that MIT scientists began looking at how the smell might actually reach your nose. They recreated the effect of raindrops falling on a porous surface. Their high-speed videos showed air getting trapped beneath the raindrop. Those air bubbles then burst and spew tiny jets of water. See them? They contain water from the raindrops and chemicals from the soil. They're forming an aerosol, tiny droplets suspended in the air, much smaller than the raindrops. Because the aerosol drops are so small, they can travel on the wind much more easily than raindrops and carry the smell of petrichor to our noses. This is the first time anyone showed that rain could create aerosols, effectively filling the air with much finer particles of water. 
but only a light rain will do it. Heavy rain doesn't create those bubbles, so a heavy downpour may not smell like much instead of carrying the poetic aroma of petrichor. Isn't that interesting? Have you smelled that? Do you know what that smell is like when there's rain down the road? I bet you didn't know that that was caused by a molecule that's basically an essential oil. And here's the little fella right here, Jasmine. But did you catch those numbers? Remember I said a shark can smell down to a part per million. The human nose detecting one part per trillion, or five parts per trillion in this case, of geosmin. How interesting is that? And why have we evolved to be able to smell something in such a sensitive way? And do you remember they said, how much is a part per trillion? Just a few teaspoons in 200 Olympic-sized swimming pools. It does make you wonder, doesn't it, why we were given such an amazing sense of smell? Well, how many different odorants can you distinguish between? It's one thing to have a very sensitive nose, but that distinguishing part is interesting, isn't it? Well, it turns out, if you look at the web and look at a lot of different publications, 10,000 chemicals that we can detect that have a distinct odor. Um, that number, I sort of, I'm always a little bit suspicious when I read things and I have to say, well, where did that come from? Where's the paper? What was the scientist? Well, it was published in 1927, quite a long time ago. And at that time, the guy who published that paper said, well, people can tell the difference between four different qualities of aroma. There's fragrant, there's acidic, there's caprylic, which is kind of that sour, nasty smell, and burnt. And he put that along a nine-point scale, and he figured out that that's about 6,500 distinguishable smells. So he rounded that up to 10,000, and that has become the educated guess for the last how many years, right? Nearly 100 years. So I guess there was another suspicious guy, Andreas Keller from Rockefeller University, and he did a much more systematic study with actual experiments and found that there was more of a multiplier effect than previously understood. For example, one odor molecule, like this guy here, can actually activate several different odorant receptors. And so what that really means is that we can detect trillions of chemicals having a distinct odor. Now, you may not be able to describe them all, but your olfactory senses in your brain are capable of that. So interesting, right? So we can smell aromas in such low amounts and we can detect so many different aromas. That's actually, I would think that you guys as oilers have a much more refined and trained sense of smell. So you're probably sort of up there in terms of your differentiation. All right, well, let's explore more of this concept with essential oils, shall we? So we know that essential oils are made up of many different compounds and constituents. Here are some of the major categories. Uh, where are we? Yep. There are about 65,000 or so possibilities that are made by the plant. I sort of wonder why as well. But interestingly enough, they're a great test case for us, right? A lot of these molecules you've heard of, right? Monoterpenes, diterpenes, sesquiterpenes. You're all familiar with those terms, right? Which is pretty amazing because most people are not, right? And there are parts of those molecules called esters, aldehydes, alcohols. So let's kind of delve into that a little bit. We can perceive very slight changes in molecules that give us profoundly different smells. Let's uh, look at lavender, for example. Okay, I think I have a bottle in my pocket. Now, our equipment can separate out the lavender, and you can see monoterpenes, which are which is heavier, monoterpenes or sesquiterpenes? Yes, the mono are the light ones, right? And then the sesquiterpenes would be heavier. So you've probably already done this experiment, but I'm just going to do it here right now. You hold the bottle out, and with a little bit of help, I can smell it already. And I can definitely smell the lavender. It's like standing in a lavender field. Now, if you put it a little bit closer, does it smell a little bit different? And it does. To me, it feels a little bit richer now. And now if I stick it right under my nose, it's different again. It's quite different to being out here. And the reason for that is that the monoterpenes travel much more easily. They're smaller, they're more volatile. And then the sort of the oxygenated monoterpenes are starting to blend with those monoterpenes about here. And by the time you've got it under your nose or on your skin, you're smelling all three 
heavy and light. So your, your nose is able to smell the difference, certainly of those larger and smaller molecules. Pretty amazing, right? I think it's amazing. It may be just kind of normal life for you, but I had to learn all this stuff when I joined Young Living, and I think it's amazing. All right, let's look at some other. We can detect the difference between very similar structures. And I'm going to give you an example of two molecules here that have the identical molecular weight and actually the identical sort of basic formula, right? Eight carbons, eight hydrogens, and three oxygens, right? And the one on the left is wintergreen that you can see here. And wintergreen, um, you know, again, the same formula as vanilla but I think you know that they smell quite different, right? So you've got sort of a, a ketone group on the, on the wintergreen. You've got the same kind of thing. You've got an aldehyde group on the vanilla. They're both around a benzene ring. Like if you talk to a chemist, he says, well, these are almost identical molecules, but the smell of wintergreen is quite different to the smell of vanilla, right? Yeah, I'm sure you're imagining it in your head because you are very familiar with both. And yet the molecules are quite, quite similar, which tells us that our olfactory receptors are very specific, very much like the door lock that you have on your house. The keys look the same, but they're not, you know, other keys are not going to open that lock to your front door. All right, here's another example. Here in these molecules, you have um, uh, garlic on the left. Same, same formula, right? C4H8S. And on the right, C4H8S, one smells like skunk and one smells like garlic. I've never associated the two. When I drive down the road and someone has run over a skunk, I don't go, hmm, smells like garlic. What's for dinner? Right? <laughs> so here's another example. Oh, well, I guess that was it for examples. Okay. Now I hear a lot about synthetic versus natural. What's wrong with synthetic? Is there really a difference? I mean, I spent a lot of years in college as a chemist learning to synthesize molecules. And, uh, you know, one beautiful Young Living brand, our brand partners really are obsessed with the concept of natural versus synthetic. And I wonder, does it make sense? So we use lavender as an example, like in this slide here that I threw together, right? What's the difference between synthetic and natural if you consider something like lavender? or most things, but we use lavender as an example. Well, first of all, it's composition. When you get it from nature, it's very complex, right? It's not simple at all. So it's more like the group on the right side there, lots of different molecules in there. And that gives it a very nice scent complexity, just like I showed you, heavier molecules, lighter molecules, very rich, right? Obvious difference is that the plant makes something natural, but something that's synthetic is made in a lab. The plant is also subject to a lot of natural variation. Like how hot was it that year? How did the sun shine more sort of strongly? Was it a more rainy year? What part of the world is it grown in? That actually gives it a lot of differences, <clears throat> not only from sort of uh, geography to geography, but year to year because of the climate. But with the lab, no variation, right? I mean, they pride themselves in the lab of making something that's very, very uh, uniform each time. And then finally, other other properties. So we know that um, natural lavender is really loved because of what it can do for us. Just, uh, you know, whether it's feelings or, you know, some of the things that some of the reasons why we buy lavender, right? But do the synthetic molecules interact in the same way? Well, let's, um, let's explore that a little bit, at least from the chemistry perspective. Now, if we look at our hands, for example, what's the difference between our hands? Is our left hand the same as our right hand? They're not the same. They are not superimposable, right? But they are mirror images of each other, right? So they're quite different, but they're almost the same. And I sometimes get mixed up when I'm on Zoom. Like, is that my left hand or my right hand? I can't tell, right? Mirror, same thing. I mean, sometimes you can't tell. Um, in terms of chemistry, that is a real thing. Many molecules have handedness as well. They're called chiral centers. It's called, there's this whole thing called stereochemistry. So when you're trying to synthesize something in the lab or in a factory, it's actually very difficult to direct 
stereochemistry. But plants, they do it by the power of the sun and with enzymes. So they direct the stereochemistry very nicely. And this leads to what we'd call stereoselective compounds, right? So they have, in most cases, one major, what they call an antiomer, right? You usually get the right hand rather than the left. Um, sometimes it's the other way around, but nature provides these. And many molecules in nature interact directly with our receptors in our body. Right, our nose can smell the difference sometimes between different molecules. But what about our body? An example might be vitamin E. Vitamin E has a D and an L form, right? The dextro, the levo, the right, the left. Now, they're both very good antioxidants because they've got a lot of those lovely hydroxy groups on them and a couple of double bonds. But actually, there are receptors in our body for vitamin E, and so only the natural form can interact in exactly the right way. So I wonder about the essential oils. Is that the case? Probably, right? Well, let's talk about um, stereochemical chemistry with the molecules. Here's a molecule that's called carbon. So you can see here, if you look here, it's kind of like the left and the right hand, isn't it? You've got the R and the S form. And I told you that in nature, nature can direct the stereochemistry really nicely. And that you can't usually do that in the factory without a lot of effort. But there turns out to be um, one plant, spearmint, that creates a certain kind, right? The kind, the R kind, and the caraway plant actually makes the other. The question to me or to you would be, can you smell the difference? Do you think you can smell the difference? I don't know. They look pretty similar. Let's try it out. I'm going to put some, one of these onto a smell strip and see if you can tell the difference, I'm going to smell it first. I'm going to put a couple of drops on here. Hand it to my assistant, Bethany. And I'm going to give Bethany the microphone. And can we have, a, would you like to be a volunteer to come up and smell this? Yeah, have a, have a sniff and tell us what you think it smells like. It, ha it has a smell a little bit winter greeny, a little spearminty to me. <laughs> and there's another lady on the front. Would you like to come up and smell as well? And tell me what you think it smells like. Just give me a couple of words. Because you guys, you know, the thing is animals have great sense of smell, but they don't have a vocabulary like us. And that's one of the things that I've learned at Young Living, like all of the different descriptions for aromas, like woody or spicy or warm or cold. It smells like spearmint. It smells like spearmint? Does it smell like spearmint to you as well? A little bit of winter green. To okay, me, but yeah, a little bit which of is kind of common in the spearmint. Yeah. To me, it smells like a very, um, a very warm and kind of well-blended spearmint, even though it's just one molecule. All right, both of you stay there. I'm going to give you the carbone that was synthesized by caraway. And let's see what you think it smells like. It smells have like a vinegary almost smell. To a little bit vinegary? Okay, yeah, it's a different. It hits you a little bit quicker, this one, doesn't it? Now I'm going to feel silly, but... It, it smells peppery to me. Okay. Yeah, there's still a little bit of that in there. I don't smell, um, it, smell it again and tell me if you think it smells like dill, if it reminds you of dill. Oh, it does. Right? Yeah. But it does have the black peppery smell. Yes. But it does smell like dill. Isn't now that I crazy? I smell the dill now. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. Thanks so much for volunteering to... I know you're very vulnerable when you have to describe aromas. It wasn't really a test. It was just like, uh, just to demonstrate that your nose can, even if you didn't go to chemistry in college and you didn't learn all about stereochemistry, your nose knows all about stereochemistry. It's really quite amazing what we can detect. Pretty cool experiment. I love that. All right. So now it, it sort of makes me ask the question, why? Why are our noses so good at smelling 
at such low, low levels, like in the example of petrichor, or so many different variations. Why, why is that so important to our survival? I'm not going to get into that today a lot. Suffice to say that this was one of my biggest learnings as I came to young living, right? That, that um, smell is a really interesting thing and it can enhance our lives. It can change our mood. It can uplift us. It can remind us of things. Um, Helen Keller, very interesting person to talk about smell, right? Because she couldn't see, she couldn't hear. Smell is a potent wizard that transports you across thousands of miles and all the years that you've lived. Now, there's a book um, by Linda Harmon, and she talks about in the opening chapter of this book called uh, Chemistry of Fragrance, she, she quotes Sigmund Freud. Mankind, when mankind got together to cultivate and build, one of the casualties of civilization was a diminution of the sense of smell. So he's pointing out that we kind of lost something when we became industrialized. And this is what I love about Young Living because it feels like we have that connection again to some of the things that we might have lost and we can enhance our lives through that. Um, let me continue with uh, Linda Harmon's quote. The most recent inventions have been linked to the more dominant senses of vision or hearing, television, telephone, computers, iPod, but when we want to retreat, it is to the more emotional senses of smell or touch or taste that we turn. So why is fragrance so evocative? Again, with the quote, simply because of the way we are structured. Smell is one of those, one sense whose exact mechanism remains a mystery. I don't know about that. I highlighted it in yellow because I think we'll try to unravel that a little bit later but which we do know is plugged directly into the part of the brain that is responsible for memory and emotion. Thank you, Linda, because that's a good segue into the next slide, right? Um, so we know that the same part of the brain that processes mood and emotion and motivation and all these other behaviors is the part of the brain actually where, once it passes those cells in the nose, actually goes straight to that part of the brain. Now, we don't actually have a have proof that there's a physical connection, that there are neurons that connect from the emotional and the motivation and the memory part of the brain, but they are very closely physically located in the brain. And that's the biggest clue. You know, a recent study came out that showed that like in an office environment or in a work environment, the um, if you place people that work together closely, that their work efficiency increases um, you know, exponentially. So with the distance that you move those teams away from each other, let's say you put marketing on the third floor and you put um, you know, uh, R&D on the second floor, then they're not going to work together very well. But if you put them next to each other, there's a natural interaction. And I think maybe that's why we were designed this way, right? That limbic system that is responsible for those emotions and memories and everything else right next to that, um, you know, those that sense of smell and where that goes in the brain. And there's a lot of communication that goes back and forth between the cortex too. So let's say you're smelling something like smoke. You go, hmm, that smells interesting. Well, there is a part of the brain, obviously, that thinks that says, wait, that's smoke. Get out of here, right? Um, I've got a couple of minutes. I'm probably going to go over, but I started early. So I wanted to describe one experiment. There was an experiment that was done at the Monell Institute, which I find really interesting, where they do functional messenger RNA, they do the functional um, MRI on the brain, so brain imaging. And you can see what part of the brain is being activated because it kind of lights up red. And they, uh, they told these people that they were doing a study that associated pain and, and aromas or something like that. So put um, in a darkened room, um, let's say, you know, one of the subjects was a woman, and infuse rose into the room and you see a certain part of the amygdala light up sorry slide guys it's not in the script i've kind of gone a bit off script here so don't panic i always do this to the slide guys um now the next day same woman comes into the room they darken the room and instead of the smell of rose they give a tape a recording of the voice of her young daughter and the same part of the brain lights up isn't that amazing it just shows you how close that sense of smell and, and emotions and other things are connected. Well, how does it all work? How does your nose distinguish between more than 10,000 different aromas? One amazing lady asked this question. It used to be an enormous mystery, right? 
um, for thousands of years, people have been able to smell things and scientists didn't know. Um, so Linda Buck really became fascinated by this, right? And so um, for, for years, scientists has, had posited the existence of odorant receptors, sort of proteins that they assumed would be somewhere in the nose. And uh, these would pick up small molecules and excite something, but they really didn't know anything about it. How many are there? Everyone that had tried to find them hit a brick wall because the odorant receptors had eluded everyone who'd gone looking for them. Um, Buck and her co-worker in the lab, Axel, her boss, tried a different tack. They looked instead for the genes that encode them because they knew that it would be a certain type of um, you know, protein structure. Well, this took years and years of long days and late nights. These people were totally married to this research. I'm kind of glad we have nerds like that that are helping us understand nature. When the results finally came rolling in, Buck's feeling, first feeling was neither pride nor relief, but absolute awe. So here she is working in the lab. In fact, there was a teacher at Roosevelt High School that wrote in her yearbook, like, one day you're going to make an amazing biologist. And she thought at the time, that's really strange. But here she is discovering these olfactory receptors. And here's an animation of what it would look like. So each one of these green guys is an odorant receptor. And you see, oh, that's the wrong odor. It's not going to bind to that key and lock kind of system. But, oh, here's one. Hmm, smells like caraway, right? And once that happens, then it, it sort of lights up a signal. It's powered by ATP, so you don't lose the signal. That signal goes to the brain and then, uh, and then lights up that part of the brain and helps you to remember what it is, right? So Buck thought this was just an amazing thing. She was totally moved by nature's marvelous invention. And actually, in Buck's writing, she always capitalizes nature with a capital N because she has this like reverence having discovered this amazing thing. She says that nature is quite elegant in its design. It's a wonderful puzzle. So as a result of the work that she did, she was able to put together some of these things that we'll call heat maps, where she was able to identify or name the different receptors. And uh, um, spoiler alert, they've discovered 389 of these different odorant receptors, these olfactory receptors. And so you look at something like an odorant on this left side and the receptor on the top. So you can see that hexanoic acid is just a six carbon, very simple molecule with organic acid. It's gonna light up number 19, gives it a certain smell, rancid, sour, goat-like smell, right? Then if you look at hexanol, that's also six carbons, but instead of a, 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 an acid group, it's got just an alcohol, not very much different. And it's gonna light up two different receptors, right? The lock and key thing is working, but it, it lights up more than one. Maybe the tail end of the molecule goes into one receptor and the front end of the molecule goes into, into number three, right? And that gives you a sweet herbal woody smell. If we go now to heptanoic acid, so now we've got seven carbons in this, and wow, that one's lighting up receptor one, receptor 18 and 19, and so on. Rancid, sour, sweaty smell, like my son's bedroom, I'm thinking, and so on. And so you can see that using this kind of a approach, you can start to unravel what this is like. Now, I just want to diverge for a sec here and look at an interesting mystery that arose from Buck's work. Of course, she's, she's looking at the receptor, she's looking at the gene expression, and she discovered that it wasn't just the olfactory receptor that had, I mean, in the nose that had these olfactory receptors, but some in the chest, some in the GI, some in the arms, some in the legs. And you might wonder, well, what on earth are olfactory receptors doing in other tissues in the body? I mean, the quads don't smell anything, right? But they have olfactory receptors, which means that those odorants are doing something. They're activating something. Now, when I first came to this company and I saw the raindrop and I saw people sort of massaging oil into feet, it really made me wonder what's going on. But maybe this, uh, maybe there's a lot more that we need to discover here. I thought this was very interesting. Well, for all of her great work, Linda Buck, was well-deserving of the 2004 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, right? Pretty amazing uh, for the discoveries that they did. And in fact, cool story, that high school teacher from Roosevelt High that, that told us she would make a great biologist one day, um, sort of uh, found out that she won the Nobel Prize and, uh, 
and they met up together and you, what that says to me is wow you never know how your words are going to affect someone and affect the direction of their life but let's see if we can extend buck's work and do systematic and rigorous studies of olfactory response to essential oils i won't so you remember the uh the heat map that uh, that buck did i wonder if young living could sort of do some more research in that area and help us and in fact we are this is dr wu who you probably know and you may have visited him if you went to the farms booth uh, at the expo he's a phd in agriculture and medicine so this guy doesn't just have one phd he has two and i don't know about him but one phd nearly killed me um, so this guy's a bit of a glutton for punishment right but he is amazing originally from korea lives and works in japan and is working for us with us at young living um, so he works sort of juggles between the farm in Okinawa and Chibu University, where he does a ton of this really cool research. Now, here's some of the work that he's doing. Here's a grid pattern of the 389 olfactory receptors that we know of. And so when you smell something like cherry, this is just obviously theoretical, right? Just for demonstration purposes, because if you line up the receptors, it doesn't really look like a cherry, but depending upon which receptors are lit up, you're going to smell cherry, right? And your brain recognizes that aroma. So what can we do? How can we sort of unravel this? Well, this is the cool part. You can actually create cells um, that have the gene for each of the different 389 olfactory receptors. So one cell has one of those receptors, receptor number one or whatever it might be. Actually, they give them unnecessarily complex names like A321A or something. But now imagine that you have a plate with all of the different cells, and those cells each have um, one of the olfactory receptors in them. And you can actually rig up some chemistry in the cell where um, you put something in there so that if the cell, if that odorant receptor is occupied, then it triggers um, a fluorescent. So it's kind of like a firefly butt, right? In fact, that's literally what they use. Did you know that if you squash firefly butt, I used to use them in the lab, you powdered firefly rear ends or abdomens, right? Have got a um, luciferin luciferase kind of uh, enzyme thing there. If you add ATP to it, it glows. So now imagine this panel of receptors and you waft some lavender over it and the cell will light up if that receptor is occupied. And so you know which receptor is being activated by lavender. So here's the work that we've done. On the top left here, you see lavender. That's what it looks like. It's not quite as straightforward as the, the cherry that we looked at, but you can get an idea of which receptor is occupied and how strongly. And then we have two other examples here, shell ginger, two different kinds of shell ginger from the farm, and they light up different receptors. So we're going to be doing a bunch of work in the future to help sort of unravel this a little bit better, to try to connect which receptor is activated and what behavior or what mood is associated with those particular receptors being lit up. So I see an amazing future here. In fact, I really tried to get one experiment ready for today, which was where we try synthetic lavender and compare it to our natural lavender and see if the... Uh, you know, if the pattern is different and how much more, I imagine it would be much more complex with uh, natural lavender for the reasons that I already explained. So that ends my talk today. I hope that's given you a little bit of an appreciation for the amazing olfactory receptors that we have, for the amazing noses that we have, that were even better than sharks. And more than that, we can actually even talk about the aromas that we, that we smell uh, instead of just thinking food every time we smell something. So thank you very much. <laughs>
essential oils work and how the science of sense works within our body and mind. Um, I encourage you to grab your oils and go create some new experiences today. Use that knowledge to maybe try something that you haven't tried before um, and never forget the experiences that you have. Because at the end of the day, we can have all the head knowledge that we want, but unless we actually are using our oils and putting them on and experimenting with them and really enjoying the benefits of them, doesn't matter. We don't need just head knowledge. We don't just need another reference book. We need to be putting these things into practice. So I hope that uh, this inspired you to do just that. And I appreciate you spending your time learning um, and expanding your knowledge and being here today. So I will um, go ahead and get this uploaded to YouTube so that others can watch the replay. You are free to share this with friends and family members who may be interested in this information. And we will be back again next week for episode seven. So for those of you that are here live, I'm going to end the recording and we can chat on the other side. Thanks for joining.